a, a bubbler fountain. And that way you can really open up to a plaza. You can you know, really have the community or those who came to this part of the campus, give them some place to sit and give them a way to enjoy and interact with the water. That way we're still getting you know, our nutrient credit through like the cistern itself, but we're also getting like public engagement. And so this is kind of what it looks like towards the, the start of construction. Where once we kind of get the area sealed off, you know, we'd, we'd have to dig down and rip up the bottom of the concrete fountain. I guess let's go through some, some construction pictures just to kind of provide some context of what is there. So once we got rid of the concrete fountain, we had to excavate down beneath where the original fountain was. We kept the border of the old fountain because that's kind of became like the footprint for what the plaza was going to be. So we removed about just shy of 7,000 square feet of impervious area and with the goal of converting it to something that is, that would be better in terms of like the public can enjoy it, add some turf grass area, add a filter, like some sand filters. Sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. Not, not a sand filter, but add something that's permeable and would drain to the cistern. But part of the way through, like when we started getting estimates, like we ran into a large issue. All the quotes we were getting for sand came in at a very high price. And so it was originally more than what we were envisioning. So when it was kind of brought up at like a joint coordination meeting, one of the other business areas within Fairfax County Public Works is like our solid waste management program. And they had a problem of their own. They had an excessive amount of crushed glass at the time because they, they couldn't find uses for it. They were collecting it, but they didn't have a whole lot of uses for it. And so they offered to uh, provide crushed glass and that would ideally off we'd be able to use crushed glass and you know get away from sand because of the cost of the sand. And since you no, know, it was kind of in-house all under public works, they'd just be able to provide the crushed glass. So it'd be like a significant savings for the county. So this is kind of what it looks like when we started with the crushed glass. So they, they ran tests on it, they ran through a sieve and it I will get to it later in the presentation. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it meets like a VDOT spec for 21A. But in this case, we want to use the smaller end of the spectrum because we wanted to use it kind of in lieu of sand. So in the picture, we kind of see where the we're installing the crushed glass over gravel. But then we ran to partway through construction, we ran into a different problem where our solid waste was running out of crushed glass. So we had to switch back to sand. So originally the design started off using nothing but sand. Then we switched it kind of after the design was done from sand to all crushed glass. But then when supply ran out, we had to kind of switch it back to sand. So was, we got like a layer or one foot layer of crushed glass on top or underneath a one foot layer of sand. And all the while, all that's gonna be on top of our cistern, which is pulling water from 2.3 acres of a prairie area from the parking garage that you kind of see in the background. So like looking at the like the before and after, it's kind of what was envisioned. And one of our late landscape architects who initially conceived of the, the plaza idea and did some of the initial design sketches for it. No, provided an excellent layout where you no know, the community would be able to get to it from like three different angles and kind of where the, the community aspect really comes in is like one of the initiatives that one of the other agencies with the Fairfax County they have what was called like food truck Fridays where they'd bring out food trucks and employees and members from the public who were there at the building would have you no know, options to go and get food at lunchtime. 
but where the plaza really came in in terms of that community outreach is it, it provides place for for seating so people can actually enjoy it and we're currently waiting on some benches but we're going to add benches all around the plaza that way we can try to really encourage people to interact with the the running water and the water itself you know that we have a much smaller pump that's more efficient and it pulls water from the 15,000 gallon cistern and it runs it through a little rock in the center of the plaza we had a core drill and add the, the pump system nearby and so you have water bubbling up after a rainstorm and our maintenance is, division is still kind of messing around with the settings to try and change when we are going to when we have it running because now it's a question of like do we want it running continuously after a rainstorm or do we want to run it only between certain hours and when it's the plaza is more likely to be used like at lunchtime or something so we're still kind of tinkering with the settings to figure out when it's best to run it but that little pump that we have i don't rec remember the specs on it it can clear out a full cistern in less than a day. So we're trying to be extra careful on on because what we want to do is we want it running where people can see it. Because if we fill it up and we run it overnight, no one's going to be able to enjoy the water that way. But we also used crushed glass in the, the nearby tree filters. What was unique about the tree filters in that they were right next to the street. They were kind of like an add-in with the at the last second because, like you know, most of the attention is going to go to the cistern itself. But we wanted to add these tree box filters because of location. And what what's unique about tree box filters is we are each tree box filter is going to have a different soil media in it. One thing that we're doing is we're trying to change up the soil media because we want to see is there a soil media that would be more beneficial for street trees like we're noticing in a lot of locations throughout the county where we're adding all these street trees the trees are struggling to, to survive in some instances so we're trying to change it up to figure out is there something that we could do to help the trees become more successful and so on, you know, during winter operations, this area is going to receive a, a large amount of salt, just, you know, to keep it safe for travel. That salt's inevitably going to wind up next to the street trees. So does, does the change in the composition of the soil media mix provide something that is better for the trees to be able to better withstand the salt? I'll just out of curiosity, since we are in the area, So this is like the design of what the, of the street trees and how it receives water. Like we added like a little area way underneath the curb that would go into the that little center section between the two tree pits. That's only about six inches deep. Then water fills up and it spills over into where the tree pits are. Now, if it receives a large amount of water, we have emergency overflow. But the idea is like to kind of force water into where the trees are going to go. And the, and the tree pits themselves also have had their sand replaced with the crushed glass. And so this is kind of what the tree box filters look like right now. They're like everything, the project was substantially complete in late January. So we're still getting maintenance set up, but no, we are seeing a lot of usage of the area from the public and from the nearby daycare as well and so kind of focusing on like the crushed glass itself you know it like the 2016 Vietnam Run bridge spec provided a way for us to use crushed glass and at the time of design the 2016 Run bridge spec was what was the, the latest and greatest but I went back and checked the 2020 and it has the same language in there and so this is, the picture is the operation that our solid waste uses to crush the glass. We're kind of going from right to left. They will insert the glass into a funnel. They'll get conveyor, carried up by a conveyor belt into a rotating hammer, which will break it down. And then the, the second conveyor belt kind of raises all the crushed glass into a sieve. Like it kind of separates it into like three different areas where you have your larger grain particles that's in the, the right side of the two alcoves that you see. 
and then the SAN into the, the left alcove. And then like all the things like bottle caps and labels, they, they get thrown into a dumpster when they don't go through any of the sieve. And then community use. This is the ultimate end goal other than like stormwater enhancement. And I mentioned that the nearby daycare utilized this area. I was talking to a coworker who had a child in that daycare and she mentioned that I think they had some, uh, like a duck nest into the, the playground of the daycare. And so the daycare couldn't use the playground because of the wildlife. And so they brought the kids out to the, the plaza. And when I was out there, I saw kids crawling all over the rocks, you know, en enjoying the use of it. And so I thought that was a, just kind of made my day because I really enjoyed it. I heard about it, but until I saw it myself, it's like, ah, it's really hard. How could they use it? And then lo and behold, the day I was out there, they were out there. So this is my contact information. I know I only had about 15 minutes. I went a little bit over. I was trying not to rush it. Apologize. So if anyone's got any questions, how do I see? Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Does anybody have any questions for Fred? I Seems do like have a oh, go ahead. I do have a couple questions, Fred. That was very interesting. Um, I, my name is Barbara. I work for the city of Chesapeake. Um, a couple questions about the glass. Uh, recycled glass component did so are is Fairfax picking that up as part of a curbside program or not is anymore like be, is sorry. it being separated out from the recycling um because we have a mixed recycling program in Chesapeake and then I was interested in the cost of the equipment and the labor that's needed to run that glass crushing operation Thank you. Right, so let me write down that. Let me write down that question because I don't, in terms of like the, the cost of the glass crushing program, I don't have that specific information. I have to go ask the solid waste to see if they can provide any numbers, but something I can certainly do. But in terms of like collecting the glass, like Fairfax County used to have, used to, we used to collect it at the curb, but I want to say about six months ago, probably closer to eight or nine, we stopped doing that. And so what the way, it, what it, how it works now is like we have these large purple bins and like parking lots throughout the county and residents have to drop off glass or they can take the glass directly to like either the I-95 I landfill, which is where the recycling operation is, or I-66. So not, now we kind of ask the, the residents of Fairfax County to clean the glass and to drop it off. Thanks. I had a couple questions too. Um, thanks, Fred. That was a good presentation. Uh, my name is Jim. I'm with the city of Virginia Beach. I actually moved down from Fairfax County just a couple years ago. So I remember the fountain that you, you guys are talking about. And I remember seeing it bare and nothing in it. And so it looks great. Look, this is a huge improvement. Uh, so you guys did a good job. Um, I had a question about the crushed glass as well. I see how it's used as backfill for the um, rainwater harvesting, but for the tree boxes, were those tree boxes, are, are they decorative tree boxes or are they providing any water quality credit? And then the follow-up to that is, what was the approval process to get crushed glass for the tree boxes as as sand because it's it's not exactly the same use uh i guess as the backfill you know right uh so right now we're not because we're because of the way we changed the soil media we're only taking credit really for the cistern and so okay. it's more of like a test bed to see whether we can improve the the health of the trees long term, given the conditions like being right next to the road sides. Okay. Do you think there's any plans to, you know, if if you show that the health of the trees are good, that this could be 
something that could be implemented for a water quality tree box in the future? I do think that's where we want to go. OK, cool. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Fred, I had a quick question. This is Katie from the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. I was just curious, you mentioned early on in the project there was an overabundance of the crushed glass available, but then halfway through they were short on it. So how is that supply, I guess, managed now? And is the demand, does it the demand um, overshadow uh, the supply or what's that like? So I'm told the reason why we had started running out of issues with the glass is because a couple of contractors were also figuring out how to use glass on some of their projects. I don't know exactly how they were, but I know because at the time it's like they had an abundance and they they were just trying to get rid of it. So now that there's actually a demand for it. Hard to come probably, by now. <laughs> it's harder to come by. I don't know if the always program has set up a program for in terms of how it's going to be distributed going forward because it might it might become kind of like a a revenue source in the future I, I don't know for sure yeah very cool thank you glad you got some while you could <laughs> there are a couple applications i know that we were used it on so i was happy that we we're able to use it on this project i mean prior applications I'm aware of has mostly just been like for bedding for when you're like resetting a pipe. So I was happy to use it in a more, I guess in a different manner that could actually be sold to the public. So hey, it's not just pipe bedding, we're also using it in other applications. Well, it's exciting to see somebody actually do the multiple benefits thing really well. I think that seems to be a uh, you know a buzzword and a, a concept everyone's trying to embrace, but it's not always easy to to execute. So um, if anybody else has a question, um, jump in. I'm going to go ahead and have maybe um, y'all the transition from these slides to the next topic. And uh, thanks, I really appreciate you all you giving a presentation. It's nice to be able to to have some speakers from outside the area. Um, it's the upside of all these virtual meetings. I was happy to speak about it. I guess how do I? I don't use WebEx so much, though. Am I still sharing my screen? Nope. I am seeing solar slides now. All right, I'll last call before we move on. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. So the next thing on the agenda is um, we talked about doing kind of a series of presentations about solar, and there's a couple different. Um, issues in play and as far as like what's changing in, in Virginia. And uh, so today, I think um, Casey's going to kick it off. John wasn't able to join us, um, but uh, please you know, jump in, ask questions, and it will help us figure out what to present next time. But uh, I think this is a, a good place to start. So Casey, if you're ready. I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Awesome. Um, great. Yeah, as Whitney said, we're going to be kicking off a series. So. I, I kind of am hoping the intent of this presentation is to give you an overview and bring everybody up to speed. And I certainly got up to speed pretty quickly on this topic in the past couple of weeks with John's help. Um, and then think about as, as I'm going through these slides, who else you'd like to hear from or what hot to topics that we, I might be bringing up you'd like to hear more about? Um, because there's so much that I could talk about, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to touch on everything um, as best I can. So um, I really want everybody to be thinking, and at the end, I'm going to ask and put in the chat, whatever you need to do, email me. Um, so we can set up more people in the future that are actual experts <laughs> in this arena. Um, so John helped me out a lot with this, and I, I did a crash course with him to, to come up to speed with everything he knows. If you have specific planning questions, um, might have to defer. But um, anyway, let's get started. So uh, where am I here? Here we go. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, why? So what do, why are we talking about solar? Why is it so important right now? Um, what are the implications? What do we see as some big big picture items? And then of course, what's on the horizon and feedback from you guys as to what more you wanna hear about. Um, so we're gonna start with Virginia's Clean Economy Act. Um, this was the omnibus energy legislation that passed by the General Assembly in 2020. 
and it sets the renewable portfolio standard of 30% by 2030 and 100% by 2045. And what that did was declare 16,100 megawatts of onshore wind and solar to be deemed in the public interest. We can see that we're roughly as of 2020 at 2300 megawatts or 14% of that goal. Um, this uh, doesn't um, include the offshore wind component, which we are going to be hearing some uh, more about today uh, later on. That declares about 5,200 megawatts of offshore wind in the public interest. Um, and that's roughly the size of the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project. But I'm not going to steal Matt's thunder later. So um, I won't, we won't be talking about that today. So um, the vast majority of the 16,000 megawatts is going to be coming from utility scale solar facilities. Um, and so then after the Clean Economy Act came the 2021 Virginia Clean Energy Policy, which essentially replaced the Commonwealth Energy Policy. Um, and it, its intent was to emphasize clean and renewable energy, and it recognized the health, safety, and welfare implications um, of addressing the climate change and enhancing resiliency. So, um, you know, you can see that there in the first bullet, really, to advance the health, welfare, and safety of the residents of the Commonwealth to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to reach net zero emission by 2045 in all sectors. And by sectors, um, we're talking about electric power, transportation, industrial, agricultural building, and infrastructure sectors. And also um, another uh, tenet of this was to promote environmental justice to address and prevent energy inequities in historically economically disadvantaged communities. So that's um, kind of some lofty goals. Some are considering that rather aspirational, but um, we're likely going to be seeing some of these goals turn into law in the coming years. So um, with that kind of, um, uh, you know, basis of, of where we're at and, and why, this is kind of the reason why solar is really kind of jumping ahead in Virginia. I'm going to go into a little bit about the state permitting and so that when I go through the next couple of slides, you'll understand more about um, what I'm talking about in terms of where we're actually at in terms of the, the wattage and the acreage in the state. Um, so the state permitting process is in buckets of megawatts. And if it might help folks, I you know, this is all new to me. I know some of you are probably much more well versed than I am, but one megawatt is roughly equal to about 10 acres of land. So a small project is considered less than five megawatts. And essentially um, that's the section 130 permit. And you basically submit proof of compliance with local land use ordinances to DEQ. Now, what's interesting about this is when I was putting some of the stats and data together, one of the projects in York County is actually, I think 120 megawatts, but it is considered a, a section 130 permit because it includes um, it was on previously disturbed land. So it's a big project with a lot more megawatts, but uh, a section 130 permit. So then we have the next bucket, which is the permit by rule, which spans between five and 150 megawatts. And that is administered by DEQ. And then we have the larger projects, which are greater than 150 megawatts. And that is um, administered by the State Corporation Commission. I believe there was a news release a couple of days ago that nine projects were just approved by this SCC recently, so several in our region, um, one in Chesapeake that was a formal PBR, um, the Grassfield Solar Facility was a permit by rule and then got uh, that notice of intent was removed, withdrawn, and uh, Dominion took over that situation and is now considered um, approved by the SCC. So it gets confusing when you're trying to look at this data because there's uh, various avenues of information. Um, and so you'll see that here in this plot is kind of where Virginia's, where we're going in Virginia and where we've come from. Um, the axis on the left, of course, is megawatts. On the right, we have acreage and the green bars represent the megawatts. And you can see those numbers um, in white are the number of PBRs actually issued by the Commonwealth. So um, really, really growing um, in terms of our PBRs being issued. And we, we have four so far in, in 2021. And the acreage is that yellow line, it's cumulative. So we are over 30,000 acres um, devoted to solar facilities so far. We, in 2020, were ranked fourth in the nation. Um, the, this is information on the right has gotten from a different website. Uh, the information on the left is uh, really easily, readily available by DEQ. Um, and I believe it's updated frequently, um, but the total solar investment is about $2.2 billion. And we're projected to grow, of course, 
over the next five years. So it's, it's exponential at this point. Um, and you can see in this map, again, this information is provided by DEQ. They have a new mapping portal too. So it's pretty easy to create your own databases and your own maps um, from this information. But we have applications in review are the blue dots, the NOIs, notices of intents that are active, are yellow and the active permits. And these are all, again, only for the permit by rules. Those larger facilities aren't gonna be shown on here, um, are in the pink dots. So we currently have about 50 active PBRs, um, totaling about 2,700 megawatts, 33,000 acres, 61 notices of intent. Now this is where it gets tricky and we might not be seeing all of our data or information because notices of intent can be withdrawn as I was saying, there was that grass field site that had a notice of intent and it would have been on this map, but it is not because Dominion, um, I'm not really sure exactly what happened, but it is now a Dominion's possession and that went through the SEC. So we have almost a doubling of where we are now with the notices of intent, but again, not an inclusive list. Within that 58 active PBRs are these Section 130 permits. Again, those smaller, potentially smaller facilities, although we have that one in North County that's pretty darn big. Um, but there's 42 across the state. And those are, since again, those are smaller projects, they're about 140 megawatts or 17, 1,800 acres. So um, there's really been a push to get more. If you can see that that chunk of Southwest Virginia is pretty empty. Um, but again, a lot of that is, has to do with demand too. So, um, but there's still a really big push to get, to get more facilities out there. Um, and then I'm gonna hone in on our region, just so you know where things are happening around here. Um, lots in the hopper, um, and so plenty of NOIs, but again, not an exhaustive list if things come and go. Sometimes you can get locality approval before you submit your NOI or vice versa, but in order to get your PBR, you have to have um, your locality approval. So that's kind of the big broad brush picture of what's happening around the Commonwealth and around our region. Um, we wanted to touch a little bit about the implications. So what does all of this mean? It, it, it can really address a variety of issues, but we sort of put them into three buckets. Um, we want to talk a little bit about land use and planning. So what types of land are being converted and by how much? Um, can site suitability analyses help? I know some other regions have done site suitability analyses as they've run into issues in their, um, in their PDCs uh, or regional commissions. Um, and what about decommissioning? That, that's a hot topic, but we're not there yet because not, you know, everything's just kind of getting put in the ground. So that's really more of a gray area at this point. Um, stormwater is another really important issue because as we know, our stormwater um, permitting has to run through DEQ uh, and they are being heavily taxed by this issue. Um, there's a lot about how is that runoff being calculated for the runoff reduction method? Are the um, solar panels themselves actually being calculated? Uh, and then we have some policy and regulations we want to touch on a little bit. You know, is what we have good enough? Is it protective? Um, so I'm just going to run through those a little bit more in detail. Um, now, so with land use and planning, I've kind of, John and I have come at it from two different ways because he's a planner, but I, I also think of land use in a different way because of the work I do with the Bay Program. Um, there are a lot of things to consider. We have the future land use. So oftentimes ag and forest lands are being replaced with residential uses, but now solar is becoming predominant conversion use. And I've heard this in my conversations with um, folks working at the Chesapeake Bay program that they're seeing actually a lot more forest being converted to solar as opposed to ag or um, redevelopment being converted to solar. Um, location and compatibility is another issue. Uh, so any factor that's gonna attract development is also going to attract solar. Um, so, but solar, you know, presents these unique compatibility issues with adjacent uses. So there's just a lot more to consider, um, you know, when you're talking development versus solar. And then of course, decommissioning, what's the cost? How do you plan for that? Um, what's going to happen to those panels when they're done? Um, and, and, you know, localities have to come up with a plan, but it's actually uh, really challenging for them to think like that. So. These are some of the concerns we're having. And then again, in terms of, well, I think I talk about this in stormwater because Matt, or, uh, John and I had a discussion about how do we describe the issues with um, land use. And I think about it in terms of the Bay Program and what are those loading rates, but that's also a stormwater issue. So it's, it's really interesting um, when we start having these discussions. So 
I'll move on to storm water. There's again, a lot of top concerns related to this particular topic. So the solar fields, of course, are subject to our, our regular state stormwater regulations. Of course, DEQ, if they are the VSMP authority of an opt-out locality, they are also in charge of um, everything else related to that um, permit. And so they have to also be able to follow up on the post-construction inspections um, and report those BMPs and make sure that they are maintained um, as long as they need to be. So I had some conversations with Erin Belt at DEQ. She is very much involved with this and, in fact, was so heavily involved that DEQ um, requested that they get four FTEs to help with the solar permitting um, for stormwater. And the General Assembly said, sure, but maybe we'll just give you two instead of four. So Erin will get two more people to assist her to do this work, but it's still taking and consuming most of her time. Um, and she, one of the fun facts she told me was that on-site BMPs for um, erosion and sediment control were actually being created for post-construction. And a lot of times these solar companies are coming in from different states and they're used to the laws in the other states and the stormwater regulations. And Virginia is much different with their stormwater regulations. And so getting up to speed and educating these solar companies is also becoming a problem. And I do think that's why we do sometimes see these notices of attempts, uh, these NOIs go in and then get withdrawn. Um, and there's a lot of back and forth, and it just is extremely time consuming. Um, again, I, I mentioned the question about imperviousness. Uh, I've heard from many people that that land under the panels can become extremely highly compacted uh, under development. And then what about the panels? Some people are counting that as impervious in their runoff reduction method calculations. Some people aren't. Um, so there's no consistency there. And then again, uh, land use classification post conversion. So what is that land use underneath the panels being classified as? Is it turf? Is it mixed open? Is it um, low vegetation? All of those have loading implications if you're in the Bay program, uh, the Chesapeake Bay watershed area. So all of those questions are still kind of toss up up in the air right now. And then finally, the policies and regulations piece is something we wanted to touch on um, because there have been a lot of recent changes. Um, the landscape, you know, for solar energy has changed a lot over the last couple of years. And by granting this additional authority and leverage to the local governments, um, as they have negotiations with solar developers, it, you know, it's really helping them address the tension between like the Commonwealth's desire to see more solar um, and most importantly, utility scale solar uh, to meet the ambitious renewable energy goal. So, you know, they're trying to make a good compromise here because the localities are the ones that have to, to make these decisions. So, there were two um, bills, I guess, that came through the General Assembly. One is about siding agreements and one is about revenue sharing. Um, the way John explained this to me, it's an either or. You can't do both. But essentially, you can have a siding agreement in which you're ne like negotiating between the locality and the developer to mitigate impacts, um, address the financial needs, and it also addresses to deploying broadband. Or you can have this revenue sharing in which a locality um, can by ordinance receive up to $1,400 per megawatt of generation and storage. So you have to make some choices there. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch upon was the revised uh, PBR regulations. They're actually under revision right now. And if you go into the town hall, you can see those revisions in the public comment period ends May 14th. Um, essentially, I see a lot of definition additions to the PBR language. They are updating their fee structure. This program is supposed to be self-sustaining. And so they need to really either up the fees, change the fees. Um, there's a lot of changes in, in terms of that. And then they're also clarifying some of that Section 130 permit language. It, it takes a while to find that part about um, it's, you know, definitely less than five megawatts or 10 acres. But there's also that part about, on um, re you know, redeveloped land or previously developed land is kind of buried. And so they're bringing that language up front so that Section 130 uh, permit language can be a little bit more clear. Um, I know that there, this is not uh, exhaustive. I know that uh, lots of other regions have done some deeper dives into this and have uh, model ordinances for the localities. A lot of them have learned by uh, some kind of, I guess, big projects like in Spotsylvania County that have had a lot of hit the spotlight for a lot of major issues. So again, not exhaustive, just something that we really thought we could um, start talking about. So in terms of what's on the horizon, again, that regional coordination piece, um, should any of these regs, policies, laws be strengthened? Do we need to do site suitability analyses or help with site suitability analyses for our localities? And 
start talking about local ordinances to make sure everybody's on the same page and start looking at what other regions have done um, because there's a lot of information out there. What about other emerging issues? John was telling me about solar gardens. So those smaller section 130s are being actually increasing in rate um, in terms of getting more of those and putting them next to each other. And how do we handle that? I know the planners are very much interested in what they're calling solar gardens, um, the planning directors, I should say. Um, there is a Virginia shared solar program, which isn't quite up, up and running. And I need to do my homework on that one because I, I really can't speak to it. Um, but I think that is something that's coming and energy storage, of course, and grid reliability is something everybody talks about, but um, not kind of in general generic terms, there's always a concern for it. Um, what about maintenance? How are we going to maintain the site to benefit and support pollinators, farming, stormwater, um, adjacent uses? There's a lot of information out there about pollinator gardens underneath solar farms. Are they, you know, the magic bullet? Is that what's going to work for everybody? I don't know. Um, and of course, siting opportunities pushing brownfield redevelopment. That's a really hot topic. Um, rooftop opportunities. That's, I'm sure more people would like to see them on roofs as opposed to gobbling up land. Um, and then the, the debate of rural versus urban. So you're going to definitely see more solar fields out in the rural um, parts of your county as opposed to the urban parts of your county. So there's been a lot in the past several months um, there's a lot of experts out there. Uh, DMME, which is actually going to be changing their name to the Department of Energy here in July, uh, is really the leader in this and uh, on the state level. Um, they have a lot of resources out there and a lot of partners. They have partnered with that Soul Smart um, uh, logo down there. They've partnered with them to talk about um, local ordinances and provide a guide for localities, uh, which I haven't dived into. Um, you know, Dominion, DCR, DQ, everybody's working on this in dis different disparate ways. And so there's a lot of resources we can tap into. But at, at this point, um, you know, there was a solar summit in March that was three days long and jam packed of information. Uh, there was multiple sessions at the Virginia um, Environment Virginia meeting. So this is huge. Uh, it's a really big, big topic. And I think that we need to start, you know, if we need as a, to as a region narrow this down, I'd really love to hear more from um, you guys as to what it is, what topics you'd like to hear about more, who we can bring in, and, and let us do our homework for you so we can bring in the experts. But that's that's all I had today. And if you have planning questions, you know, wait till John gets back. <laughs> that's it. Hey, Casey, this is Matt. This is Matt from the city of Suffolk. Matt. Um, quick, quick question for you. Has there been, um, to your knowledge, um, any exploration of the topic of putting these solar panels um, on large buildings like a large warehouse? Or has it just been mainly um, just on land and field or forest right now? Do you know? Um, I mean, it, there's certainly um, a hope for that. But I, right now, the whole hot topic is, you know, what's going on the land. I know that getting them to be more in urban areas and on buildings and, you know, even parking lots as coverage sometimes. Um, I'm seeing more of that, but I, this, that's not the topic that I've heard from any of these partners. Um, but I think it's something that we certainly could start engaging in conversation if we needed to. Thanks. That's what we've heard as well, just, you know, on the land for now, but just wondering how that might play out in the future. Thank you. Other questions? Um, this is Tony from James City County. Uh, this was very good information. Thank you. Um, we have just survived issuing the first land disturbance permit for a solar facility in the county. And I would say we are still undergoing lessons learned and compiling our list of things and, and still working through some things uh, as we step through the process. But yeah, we can see that there's going to be a lot more questions and clarifications needed in the future. I called Aaron Belt many times during this process uh, to coordinate with them, so. That is Thank one you. comment she made. Thank you. Um, that coordination is the key in getting in there as early as you possibly can with her when when there's knowledge of a facility that, that's to go in the ground. So 
Um, but yeah, if there's if, if there's a lessons learned document that can be shared, um, I can also provide some from other regions that that they know had gone through this as well. Casey, I have a question about the decommissioning piece. And if, if the kind of the challenges surrounding that, is it pretty much just what are they going to do with the panels once they're spent? Or is it also this piece about what becomes of that land and the zoning? Because I'm just thinking, you know, if the panels are on agricultural land, is it a, I mean, after 30 years, can you still farm it if you took the panels up? I mean, it kind of an interesting concept, I think. And another piece of that to me is, you know, if Dominion's involved in that, it, it's hard to imagine a little bit, I think, in 30 years that they wouldn't still have that same energy need from that land. So it maybe the intent is not to restore it back to agriculture anyway. Yeah, I, I think that piece is is really interesting. I, I don't know if I had a question or more of a comment. <laughs> no, that's so funny because I that's John and I were talking about that and it, it, there's the recycling piece, which is really big because they're like, oh, you can recycle them, but we don't really know how and there's no market for it. And um, yeah, they're probably just going to end up in landfills. And then there's the what's going to happen to the land afterwards. And localities have to have some kind of a plan in place before that. But it, 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 there is no answer what it can be afterwards. I, I don't know. It's heavily compacted. Can it go back to ag? Do they want it to? Is it just prime development at that point? I it's that's the million dollar question too. We can add that to our list. <laughs> well, reach out if you have any ideas. Um, I'm trying to think of specific. We can get Aaron Belt to talk. We can get um, somebody from the Soul Smart to talk. That looked like a really interesting um, topic. Somebody from the new DOE to talk. I've heard some really great presentations out there. So. Um, if you think of anything specific you want us to hone in on, we're happy to do that. All right. Hey, uh, real quick, Casey, this is Skip Stiles. Um, I have had a long conversation with Joe Lurch at VACO about this. They've been studying it since Caroline County got jammed up with these solar panels. And they have a whole lot of, of, of good stuff that they've analyzed. Things like the machine tax exemption that sort of screws localities because these panels are exempt from machine tax, whereas other uses are not. Um, a lot of a lot of really good stuff. So you might want to reach out to Joe and see what what he's got going on. Great, thanks, Skip. Well, thanks everybody. I think this up here. Sorry, go ahead. Nope, I thought that might have been a question. Um, well, this is a good starting point. It gave us um, some more things to work on and. Uh, but we'll keep moving. We have still quite a few more presentations. Um, next up was an update on, on the Get Flood Fluent campaign. Um, Katie and Ben are gonna give you an update on what's been going on with that, so. All right, just sharing my screen. Can you all see that okay? Let me uh, take the desk. I can see I can it, but it's it. not in the full screen mode. Okay, hold on one second. How about now? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so good morning. Um, I'll try. We'll try and make this pretty speedy. We know we're right in the middle of uh, all the presentations today, but just wanted to give a quick update on where we are with the regional flood insurance outreach campaign, um, and just a little preview of some um, recent changes and additions to the assets that are available and some promotions that we have ongoing and coming up. So just a quick reminder, um, kind of the reasoning behind this um, campaign came from um, just the need to educate Hampton Road citizens um, about flooding issues and um, provide them with as many facts and um, you know data points as possible to understand why, especially here in Hampton Roads, they need to have flood insurance. Um, one of the underlying goals here is just to kind of uh, debunk some of those myths that are out there about flood insurance that um, if you're not in a special flood hazard area, you don't have to have a policy or that they're very expensive and it's just not affordable. 
Um, and ultimately, the, the goal is to drive people to get a flood insurance policy to, you know, reach out to their agent um, and at least get a quote and um, to see how reasonable it can be and, and to get coverage. There's three main components to this effort. Um, obviously, the cornerstone of the campaign is the getfloodfluent.org website. Um, I want to just highlight the fact that we have a great media toolkit on the website. If you go into the campaign resources tab in the menu, it'll take you to the toolkit where you can easily, any, any partner can easily download um, social media graphics, videos, um, fact sheets, the rack card, um, and easily share those with their audiences. And that was a really big focal point when we were developing this campaign to make all of these assets shareable um, for our locality partners and other partners to be able to get the message out. Another big part of the uh, effort is our paid media campaigns. Um, we've been doing these annually now with, um, you know, somewhat of a modest media budget, but um, we're able to kind of get the message out there uh, throughout the year to the masses, hopefully, and, um, and drive some traffic there and uh, increase the understanding of the need for flood insurance and um, ultimately drive people to get coverage. Um, public relations is a big part of that, trying to get as much earned media as we can and also um, just help our localities get the message out to their constituents. And then the flood risk and coverage calculator is a great tool that we were able to add to the website um, last year. And that is um, a tool where residents can go in there and find their address on the map, um, just make decisions about what type of uh, structure they have and what coverage they would like to have and actually get um, a pretty close estimate to what they might expect um, to pay for flood insurance coverage again, to take care of some of those myths out there that it may not be affordable and hopefully um, drive them to make a decision for coverage. So in the um, past, we launched this campaign in early 2019. Our first big media run was in that spring of that year from May to June. We did radio, TV, digital ads, which um, include the, the video ads that um, you see before watching video content. We did social media ads and also um, some print ads announcing the launch of this campaign in the pilot and daily press. We followed that up in the fall of 2019 uh, with another short stint with radio and digital. Um, came back last year um, in early June, um, in early summer or June and July um, at the start of hurricane season here and went with the radio and TV campaign again, um, pairing that with digital. We also did um, the advanced TV, which is uh, for those subscribers who do streaming. Um, delivering our ads via those platforms as well. Um, and now this isn't showing <laughs> um, for some reason. But um, here's a graph that would be showing our uh, web visitation. And this has never happened before, but um, thanks, Internet. Um, but we've, in total with those three campaigns, we've had about 7.6 million advertising impressions. And so um, that's just, you know, 7.6 million times people had the opportunity to see or hear our ads. Um, not to say that they all did or that they all listened, um, but that was the reach that we had with our campaign. Um, we've driven 7,000 clicks through those various ads, like digital ads to the website. We've had 13,000 visitors um, and about 39,000 uh, just over that uh, web page views. If you could see this graph, you would see um, web visitation uh, to the website by month. And then these um, little uh, notes here just would indicate, I mean, you can kind of imagine if this is the um, X axis and this is the Y axis. Oh, wow. I did that for you. It's me. Okay. I'm going to need to. Okay. Well, thanks. <laughs> um, so uh, you can see when we were running those paid media campaigns, this is when we see a big lift in traffic to the website. And that's what we'd expect to see. That's why we do paid media campaigns. We know that it helps to deliver the message and get people um, to come to the website who would otherwise not know about it. Um, and so um, that's just a great graph to illustrate that. I'm going to go back to um, the other version just because um, my next I'm going to show a video through this. Hopefully that will work, but thanks, Casey. Um, so in terms of actual policy counts, we're also um, trying to look at that for results. Um, we've gotten summaries from um, requests from FEMA through DCR. Um, we can see um, an increase from, you know, 2018 to 2019. Are you guys seeing weird things on the screen? No. Yeah, there's nothing sharing. 
Sorry, I must have screwed you up. It said it's starting to. I just got like an error from WebEx. <laughs> We've broken it. All right, hold on, let me try. Um, let's see. So my computer is frozen. Uh, sorry, guys. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can. I can go back to sharing and then you can send me the link to the video. Okay, okay. let's try that. I'm still seeing nothing. I think my WebEx is just totally locked up. Yeah, that's probably why you yeah. couldn't get the graph either. So, yeah. Um, it's up. How about this? Uh, it's almost Ben's turn. So, why don't, um, are you still on the policy screen? I'm just going to do it blindly. <laughs> and also, I'm on um, the tracking results. Okay. So, um, you can see on the screen a bump from 2018 to 2019, um, a slight decrease from 2019 to 2020, but overall a net increase of about 7,800 policies. We'd love to say that um, that's directly related to this campaign, um, but it is certainly the trend that we would expect and hope to see from doing this type of. <laughs> now she's gone. I think the office um, internet didn't like it. So maybe Ben, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'll take, I'll take over. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, so as, as Katie was saying, you know, we, we've seen some trends. It's harder for us to tell at this point um, to make a direct connection between what we're doing and what, you know, the trends in flood insurance policies and force are. But uh, we just recently come across some new data that we were hoping is actually going to be updated more frequently. Um, it'll just require a little more work on our part. So if we can do that, then maybe we can start to to see um, some clearer trends in response to what we're doing, um, or at least in response to you know everything that's going on. Um, so, and you know, if you, um, Katie, uh, Casey, if you want to move to the next slide, please. So this is uh, kind of what we've got going on right now, or for this year. Um, we, earlier this year, we had a Virginia Flood Awareness Week. Uh, did some social media and coordination with the PIOs. Um, we have coming up next week is National Hurricane Preparedness Week. So. I just keep going with these these uh, kind of weekly promotions that are already out there. Um, try to tie into some of the work that FEMA does and some of the work that DCR floodplain management does. And then we are going to be doing um, some paid media as well in June and July. Um, so that's you know just kind of going back to that. Well, as Katie mentioned, um, we've had a lot of success uh, with getting more people to come to the website to learn about uh, you know flood risk and what they can do and the importance of insurance. Um, and we think there's a few issues that I'm going to get into in a moment. That are going to um, uh, be important for, especially for this for the next few months. And then one thing I'll just um, highlight here is, um, you know, in the past we've done, uh, we've partnered with HRSD uh, to include um, messages on bills and as well as uh, rat card inserts and in, uh, uh, for uh, bills when they go out. And that have, has gotten people um, points for their membership in the community rating system. Uh, so that's um, it's been pretty successful. But uh, we understand um, that. Uh, we're having discussions with HRSD. They're not uh, crazy about doing the inserts uh, moving forward. Um, and so what we've talked about with the floodplain managers and the CRS user group is actually looking into developing new rack card materials and then printing those and having them at different locations throughout localities so that uh, we can uh, retain the points for uh, CRS communities that way. So um, hopefully we'll all be able to get back in person and start going back to libraries and other things like that. So if we can do that, then then we can um, you know minimize uh, the number of points lost from from not including those rack cards in a um, an actual bill, but the the bill messages are we're planning to uh, continue those if possible. So some of those points will still be available. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is where we would have the video, and I don't think um, this is just a 
I don't have access to it, but uh, what we've done is developed a new uh, online ad. Um, so this is the thing that would stream on YouTube or on a website. Um, you know, if you if you're going try you're looking at a website, this is what we would pay for for you to see. It talks about our flood risk calculator. Um, basically says what it does. Um, you know, in a, in a very brief summary, uh, and suggests like you know going to the website, um, calculating your flood insurance premium, and then using that as a starting point. In, in talking to an insurance agent about getting a new policy. So, so we're excited about that. And I think we're uh, particularly excited um, in the context of where things are going with the flood insurance program over the next several months, uh, because we tried to build in some flexibility with this ad. So it won't, um, it won't expire um, by the, um, you know, October 1st when uh, the flood insurance program changes. So um, yeah, exciting news there. And if, um, Katie can get back at some point. Maybe we can actually watch it um, at the end. You're back. <laughs> Believe Just it or not, for... <laughs> I came into the office today to avoid technical difficulties by working from home, and I learned my lesson. <laughs> Stay home. So, Katie, do you want to try to push play on the video, or do you um, do you want to skip it for now? Yes. Yeah. Let me try this now. We'll give it one more shot. Up. There's a flood coming, and you may not be protected. Because anywhere it can rain, it can flood. So even if your home is not near a Hampton Roads waterway, it can experience a devastating flood. For perspective, the damage from just one inch of flooding can cost more than $25,000. Most homeowners' insurance policies do not cover flooding. Now the time to protect yourself with flood insurance. Visit getfloodfluent.org to estimate your risk in flood insurance costs. With our quick and easy cost estimating calculator, you will learn what it might take to ensure your home from flood damage. And that helps you make informed and smart decisions before contacting your insurance agent. Whether it's from high tides, storms, or heavy rain, floods are a growing concern. There's a 30 day waiting period before your policy becomes active. So act now. Get the facts. Go to getfloodflow.org for your flood coverage estimate. Then contact your local insurance provider. All right. So that, um, sorry for all the technical difficulties, but glad we are back in action. And I'm going to just turn it over to you, Ben, so I can go hide. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you, Katie. Uh, and um, so one, you know, with the website, when we originally started uh, working on that that um, that effort, the idea was that we wanted one simple message that we could hammer home uh, to focus on that. Um, but now that we've got our, our kind of our our feet wet with it, that we want to try to expand and do um, to expand the educational content on the website. And so we are working with local floodplain managers and the CRS user group to identify some new topic areas that we could include on the website. And those are listed here. So one, we're adding, um, really we're just putting in the same flood zone mapping tool that we have as part of the calculator. We're actually creating a separate part of the website, the same tool, but with additional information about what those zones actually mean. Um, so that's you know one big part there. And then adding these messages, um, the protecting your home, protecting your property and staying safe during a flooding event. These um, the number of messages to actually kind of tell people what they should do um, or suggest what they should do uh, is one of the things that goes into calculating how many points you get for the CRS. So adding these extra messages um, to the website, to the rack cards, possibly to the bill messages um, that those will that will increase the number of points the localities get um, and also get the message out there of what you know what people can and can't do or can do to protect themselves and their their things, uh, but also what they shouldn't do. Oh, during an actual flooding event. So, um, you know, uh, we will have um, a lot of new information on the website right there. And then, you know, a few things, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, just on the horizon, these things coming up. Um, and these, uh, so the, the big thing here is um, for those of you that are following the NFIP, uh, risk rating 2.0 is something that FEMA has been working on with some of its contractors for uh, several years now. Um, this is in response to uh, the significant losses that the NFIP has had over the last several years. Um, and so this is an effort to get uh, flood insurance rates to be closer to um, the actuarial risk for specific properties. And so they have completely redesigned 
the uh, methodology for calculating a flood insurance premium. So whereas before it was all based on when your structure was built, um, it was based on kind of what flood zone it was in. Now it's a much more uh, in-depth uh, calculation that includes um, you know over a dozen different property specific uh, components to it. Um, your distance from water. Are you on a barrier island? Uh, you know how high you are. How high you are are relative to the, to the to your neighborhood. It's pretty complicated. Um, Ashley and I have been taking a look at it, and we do have um, you know our our hope is that we'll be able to to kind of get a, a way to make some similar estimates to what we've been able to do with the current flood insurance calculator. Um, so take away from that is that our calculator is really going to be it's going to be wrong come October first. Um, so, uh, you know, we want to, if possible, um, modify it to take, you know, to account for risk rating 2.0. There's a rumor out there that FEMA might be developing a similar tool anyway. Um, so if that's the case, you know, you know, we'd have to see what that tool is and what it's, what it tells people. So there's a chance that we might still be able to do something with our calculator. Um, and if not, then we could have, you know, some other way to kind of educate people about risk rating 2.0. So that's. Kind of something that's just just out there and we're paying attention to and I think we should know more, um, you know, in the next couple of months or so, hopefully. Uh, big news on the disclosure uh, front, um, you know, after a number of years of trying to get some sort of disclosure for flooding um, and flood history passed in, in, in the General Assembly uh, this past session. In the special session, the, uh, the governor signed the new legislation, which. I directed the uh, real estate board to come up with a form that's going to go on the website. So that's. Not uh, not a great amount of disclosure, but it does um, tell uh, homeowners that they have actual knowledge of, of their property being a repetitive loss. Um, as defined by the NFIP that they have to tell a, a purchaser that that information. So, so that's a big deal. Um, we think that, um, you know, that's going to, uh, that's going to help. Uh, it's not a, a huge, um, I mean, it's a big deal, but it's not, I think it's not the, the whole story. And I think one of the things that we've talked about. Internally is um, kind of training our focus on coordinating with realtors and other folks from the, the real estate industry uh, to, to teach them and educate them about uh, flood insurance and flood risk so that they can communicate that work, that information out to their clients. Um, and then 1 other thing that we've recently come across is this, you know, before we, we thought that, um, you know, it was almost impossible to get a, a hold of the flood loss history, but there is a way for a. Property owner or, or a policy holder to request that history. They have to do it in writing uh, from FEMA. I think they can do an email or a fax, but it has to be, you know, actually like a piece of paper at, at the end of the day. Um, and what we have seen in other states and what we have started to convey to the, the realtor folks that we talked to is that you can ask for this during the negotiations for a project or for a, um, for a property. So if you know, if it's in a floodplain. You could ask for this as part of the contract negotiations to ask for the homeowner, the current owner to provide that information um, and just kind of see where that takes you. So we do have kind of a form letter that people can use, and that's going to be appearing on Give Blood Fluent uh, sometime this year. So I think that's that's it we have. Yeah. So um, thanks um, for uh, giving us, um, for being graceful about our technical difficulties today. Um, but we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about where Get Flood Fluent is and where it's going. I think we answered all their questions. I just wanted to give a little shout out to Ben because he spoke to Chesapeake's Stormwater Committee about this program recently. And we really appreciated it. Um, it generated a lot of questions uh, among our committee members and a lot of questions about the calculator, I think, um, which were interesting. So thank you, Ben. And you know, I was I was pleased with how how much interest it generated in the city. So we appreciate you doing that the other month. Well, thank you, Barbara. And I'll just like that's an ad for everyone else. If you want us to come and talk to your uh, some of your citizen groups, um, please, you know, or your planning commission. That was sort of my intent. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate that. Without putting uh, you out there, Ben, but anyway, it, <laughs> it was very well received. And um, like I said, you know, they they hadn't been aware of the program. Now they are, and they can pass that information along. And I sent them a lot of 
much. I sent them all the links and everything as a follow up. So um, it did go very well. Thanks. Anybody else have any questions? We are hopefully make chipping away at making people more aware of all of these things. Uh, There's a question in the chat, and I don't know if you saw it. Is there a plan to assist homeowners in low income neighborhoods whose houses are devalued by this new statute? Do you know of any? Uh, so I assume that that's referring to the disclosure statute and the, uh, I think. I think the answer would be not no, not that well, not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, one of the the issues um, with flood insurance policies and with uh, disclosure is that there are those impacts or potential impacts on on um, you know property values. It's kind of hard to draw a direct connection between um, passage of a new of new legislation and then a, a you know the like this property lost. Ten thousand dollars in value because of that. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, certainly something that we have to keep in mind, and with the emphasis on on, on equity and um, you know impacts to, to uh, socially vulnerable areas in the context of all the stuff that's going on with resilience. But I don't believe that there's any uh, plan right now to address that particular issue as it pertains to the disclosure requirement. All right, well, I appreciate the questions, but uh, probably should watch the time. So we're gonna go ahead and transition to the next one. Uh, next up, we have an update on offshore wind. We're welcoming back uh, Matt Smith. He's gonna, I think, kick it off and then Ashley McLeod to talk a little bit about what's been going on. So if you all ready, uh, go ahead and switch to the next set of slides. All right, thank you, Whitney. It's good to be back with my friends at the PDC and in uh, the rec group. Um, so I am going to start sharing my slides here. And uh, you all can let me see here. Uh, all right, I'm going uh, to look for a thumbs up from, from Whitney or somebody that, that I'm good to go. All right, great, thanks. Um, so you all have, have heard from me and, and others in the past about offshore wind, um, and there has been a lot going on, and I'm just going to really provide a, a brief uh, kind of introduction to some of the things that have happening since we last talked, but my main point is to introduce you to Ashley McLeod. She's the stakeholder engagement director for Kitty Hawk Offshore, and the point being, you've heard a lot about Dominion Energy's Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project, but Virginia really has two offshore wind projects in the Kitty Hawk project as well that will be served out of Hampton Roads. Um, so we wanted to, I wanted to, to get Ashley in front of this group um, because of the interest you all have had in offshore wind and to learn more about that project because of its significance in Virginia. Um, but I'll go over a couple of quick refresher slides just to kind of set the table. Um, this, this slide is really just showing that the East Coast is really kind of the perfect place for offshore wind. We have a lot of large cities that are demanding power and renewable power. We have a lot of wind that's blowing uncaptured off of our coast and a shallow continental shelf that is perfect for siting offshore wind projects. Um, and I think I've shared this slide with you all before. It's really showing that to date, uh, state policies are driving the demand for offshore wind. Um, there are renewable energy requirements that are very aggressive along the East Coast and they have carve outs for offshore wind, including Virginia's. Um, which uh, you heard Casey talking about the Virginia Clean Economy Act. It requires that Virginia get 100% of its uh, electricity from renewable energy by 2050, and a large portion of that will have to come from offshore wind, 5.2 megawatts. Um, so this is a slide that I've also shown before, but there's some really important changes in it. Um, if you look over here, I think you can see my cursor. Most of these projects were colored yellow before, and it meant that the wind energy area had just been leased, but that a financial mechanism hadn't been secured yet. So the big change to this map is that a lot of these projects have turned green, uh, which is a big deal, and I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. Um, so that leads into the question of really what has changed since I've last talked to you all and really over like the last six months. And fundamentally, it's that the industry is finally real. 
Um, there, you know, has been a lot of hesitancy about whether, you know, offshore wind is, is truly happening. Um, you see states had policies, but no projects, utility scale projects have been really put in the water yet. So um, there have been a couple of ac actions that have happened recently that have signaled to the industry that it is real and that the first project um, to receive approval of an environmental impact statement was the Vineyard Wind Project. That was extraordinarily significant and the industry really took notice of that. And then the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has issued notice of intents to prepare, prepare additional environmental impact statements for two other projects. And then um, really the Biden administration has signaled to the, to the industry that offshore wind is a priority. Um, and that means having a more certain and timely federal regulatory process, having a federal target to deploy 30 gigawatts by 2030, that's 15 Hoover dams uh, for context. And then there are on the kind of the, the private side, there are now 11 projects, I believe with power purchase agreements or equivalent. Um, so what does that equal or mean? It means that there's confidence in the market and a willingness by the industry to make investments in the US. And that's what we wanna see. And that's what we're trying to take advantage of in Hampton Roads. So a little bit about what we're doing at the Alliance is trying to establish Hampton Roads as the supply chain hub for the offshore wind industry. Um, one of a couple on the East Coast probably um, we have a lot of activities that we're take, taking part of to do that. Um, we have a plan that's uh, really about business attraction, talking to companies mainly from Europe and the Gulf Coast that may want to invest in Virginia. Um, we're in the middle of a supply chain analysis right now. So understanding uh, the capability of businesses in Hampton Roads to serve the industry and how to hook them up um, with companies that may be working in the region uh, that are more established from Europe. Um, we staff a statewide supply chain development committee, and then probably most excitingly, um, we are launching the Virginia Offshore Wind Landing uh, next week, which is a co-working and networking space for offshore wind companies. Um, so I have a slide about that um, real quick. So this is, I'm actually sitting in the landing, um, and we've got some really great partners already that have become founding members and they are uh, kind of a global who's who of, of some of the companies that are looking to establish themselves in the U.S. and they're establishing a presence in Hampton Roads through the landing. So we're very excited about that. Um, and it's going to be kicked off with a ribbon cutting by Mayor Alexander of Norfolk on Wednesday. Um, so that really leads me to my introduction to Ashley and that you've heard a lot about Dominion Energy Social uh, Virginia Offshore Wind Project, but um, I'm going to let Ashley fill you in on the equally important Kitty Hawk Project that is just to the south of the Coastal Virginia Project. So I think if you have any questions for me, I'll save them until Ashley has um, presented her slides as well. So I'm going to stop sharing. Did we lose Ashley? Actually, I can see your slides, but I can't hear you. I put the slides up for her. Oh. She wasn't oh, sure okay, she good. Could. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So that's great. So I don't see anything. I have lost my internet connection. Hang on. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Would you like me to still try to share? Okay. Here, let me try to share. There was some kind of internet connection all of a sudden issues. So let's see how we do. Okay, can you guys see my slides now? Yes. Okay, great. As long as you can hear me. To, um, Matt, you text me if something happens, so I know that you're not listening or not able to hear. So, okay. Hear so you. just as you may want to pop a, into full screen mode. Yeah, there you go. All right. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Yep. All right. So this just a quick overview. Uh, Matt did a great job of of sharing. Um, <clears throat> what we have going on, but um, I'm with Kitty Hawk Offshore Wind, um, which is a project of Avant Grid Renewables. So I'm actually here in Virginia Beach area. So I've, I've been here since 92, so I, I know my way around. Um, but I thought for some of you, you may not be, as, as Matt alluded to, is uh, everybody seems to be a bit more familiar with the Dominion Bay project for CVAO. So let me go ahead and tell you a little bit more about um, there we go, about um, Auburn Grid Renewables. It's part of a global company called Ebordrola, and this is an example or a slide of our footprint around the globe of where we are involved with offshore wind. 
So we're one of the third largest in the in the world in regard to offshore wind. Um, so headquartered Iberdrola out of Spain, Scottish Renewables is a extremely very um, knowledgeable. I think Matt has even been over to East Anglia to that site. Um, I know, um, but the, a lot of our um, our folks who are participating in this project as well are uh, have worked on the Scottish Power projects. Um, you heard Matt mention Vineyard Wind as well as Park City, those areas he noted that had gone from yellow to green because they're actually moving forward. Those are a few of the projects. Um, and then here is Kitty Hawk as far as, um, as the local project. Um, we also, since we just had a presentation on solar, I thought I'd add this slide in as well because Avangard Renewables has a, a larger presence other than just um, offshore wind. We also have a lot of onshore wind as well as solar. So that was just a quick slide so you can see our footprint in the United States as well. Um, Matt kind of went over this one, but this just gives you again in regard to some of the states here uh, along the East Coast. Um, it does not include North Carolina because they don't have a legislative mandate yet in regard to power. Um, but this again shows, you know, what has already been purchased in a purchase power agreement, but here is 32,000 um, megawatts is what is um, the total number of what we're looking for between these states. Um, we actually could put 12 here on this slide um, because the two turbines from the coastal Virginia offshore uh, wind um, actually are producing 12 megawatts there. But just for quick reference by 2035, this is the demand from these states that we're looking for. So that brings us to the projects for Kitty Hawk. So it is 27 miles off of Kerala, North Carolina. Many people ask this, we did not name it, Boehm named um, the project lease area. So, and it is 36 miles to Sandbridge. And the reason why that is important for us to share with you is because we are looking to go and in this first portion, this pink section here, that is the first 800 megawatts where we have submitted the um, construction operation plan for. And that is um, that in that plan, the um, uh, proposed landing is to come into Sandbridge to connect to the grid in Sandbridge and Virginia Beach. Um, our project is of over 122,000 acres. Um, the, again, the first portion is 800 megawatts, but we, the whole area is it has the ability to um, produce up to 2,500 megawatts, which is enough to go and supply power to 700,000 homes. Our commercial operation date, um, we're looking at 2026. Um, that would be when that pink area would be actually commercially operating. Um, and then beyond that, we're looking by 2030, everything would be going otherwise, possibly sooner than that. But the full area should be 20, everything should be operational by 2030. And we have 100% control of the lease agreement. So we, um, we are, were awarded the lease from Boehm and we're uh, the 100% developers of the project. And we will, I knew that was gonna happen as soon as I start to talk. Howie, come here, there we go. But I had his bone ready for him. Sorry about that, guys. I knew that would happen. He was perfect through everybody else's presentations. Um, but um, so we're looking for um, anyone in the, that would to purchase so that through our, uh, the PJM, or, you know, which would be 13 states, and um, we're looking all throughout who could purchase our power that would be produced by there. All right. Yes. So here's just some milestones for 2020. And that is, you know, we um, had our site assessment approved in 2020. Um, in June of 20, um, we have our metrological buoy was deployed, doing all of our geophysical and ethnic um, surveys. Um, our economic impact study was released in December of 20, as well as we submitted the construction operation plan to Boehm. So again, lease was in 2017, we were awarded. I'm just gonna click through these quickly. Here's where we've been heading and where we're going to right now. We're waiting for um, our environmental review from um, the Boehm to start in, uh, with NEPA. And, and then we're also working with the state um, uh, corporate um, corporation commission for all of our approvals and uh, permitting and that type of thing. Then as things move on, um, continue to get the necessary permits, hope to be starting construction around 23, 24, so the mid 20s. And then again, the whole project is expected to go out 25, 30 years in regard to um, operation period as far as that goes. Um, so now this is kind of fun. I like this part of it myself, the economic development part of it, um, the impact, I mean, 
So this is a project that will benefit not just um, Virginia, but also North Carolina. So for the purposes of this, when we say that the Hampton Roads region actually includes the Hampton Roads MSA, which you all know would include uh, Northeast South Carolina as well. So we expect for $2 billion, this is over the course of 10 years. Um, so between now and 2030, um, that $2 billion of impact would happen in Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, 1.5 of it is mostly from the construction activities and sales. Um, average of 800 jobs over each year and bringing in 300 million in household earnings and 100 million in tax revenues. And I've kind of broken it down for you. So this is where the, you can see that during construction, that is when the most would be happening as far as the spending and revenue from construction would be taking place. But we've got it kind of chunked out here. 24 is again, we hope to start for the first 800 megawatts. By 26, we hope to have it operational and then begin on the second part. And then, um, and actually we've already have, we're, we have Kitty Hawk North, which is the pink area. The rest will be um, Kitty Hawk South. And we're proposing to go, uh, that, that will go as a full COP um, submission for the rest of the area. So um, that just kind of gives you an overview of when that spending might be taking place. And then this, again, would be um, equitable in regard to or comparable, I guess, to when we're spending money. That's also when we're, the jobs are happening. So in those construction years specifically, um, that's when you can see the majority of those jobs are happening. So while it's an average of 800 jobs, it really is some years there'll be up to 1,400 or more jobs specifically because of construction. But many people wonder what kind of jobs um, this will bring in. Um, so during the development, the construction and the operations. So we have all of the different engineering services, um, the different kinds of surveying services, geotechnical and physical, wind turbines, the manufacturing of, as well as you can see on the other course there, the operation maintenance of the whole thing, um, designing the foundation and constructing the foundations, all the substations that are gonna be onshore, um, then all the cable transmissions um, on and offshore. Um, SCAD designs and construction, and then there's the numerous um, port and vessel services that we'll need to do. And for those of you who don't know me prior to today, um, I was previously with the Virginia Maritime Association. And so we know um, that we are definitely set up in this area to have um, uh, a great support system for offshore because of our really amazing port infrastructure that we have. And because of folks like VMA and Hereta going out and making sure that the uh, legislature understands the importance of our port and supporting that infrastructure. So again, operation and maintenance. And then as far as other things, you know, there'll be drone and a, uh, you know, different kind of marine mammal detection, all the different kinds of lighting and, and that will be necessary out there for FAA. Um, I guess that would be a good time to let you guys know that we have done a great job of outreach to, um, you know, working with all the federal agencies and localities and, and all the, you know, the agencies, government agencies that are necessary to move forward with the project. Household earnings, that kind of equates or um, right along with when the jobs are available, that's when more revenue will be brought in by um, households. And then this is the breakdown of some of the income tax, sales tax, and property tax revenue that over the course of the 10 years as well, between now and, and 2030. I love sharing all this information. I'm happy to do presentations for you anytime you ask. Casey will wonder, I'll tell you, be careful to ask for her slides early because she sometimes forgets. But um, the um, one thing you can always do is go to our website with kittyhawkoffshore.com. That's where we have project updates, fact sheets, videos, resources. Um, we have a section for the fishing community where we have our metrological buoy is actually available. Fishing community loves it. So if you have any fish folk in your life, make sure they know that they can see in our um, wind area, we actually can, they can see the conditions that are happening there. Um, we work with the military, as we said, not just um, to make sure that we can uh, play nicely in the sandbox together and share the waters, but also because we recognize that there are many jobs from the military that are transferable into the offshore wind industry which leads right into workforce development. We're very happy to be participating with the Mid-Atlantic Training Alliance. And there's lots of other um, opportunities that are going to continue to evolve um, to go and do the training. It's um, Ashley wearing her Virginia Beach Hampton Roads hat and love of the area. I truly believe, as Matt mentioned, that we can be a hub for training as well as just the, the industry as a whole. And I think we should look into that even more. 
Um, economic development wise, we have a place with uh, when you, if you just do a slash vendors that or it's on each page, you can actually <clears throat> register to let us know what services you provide so that when we're doing RFPs, um, companies that have services that we need, we can actually make sure they're aware um, so that if they are interested in trying to procure um, contracts with us. So our website has a variety of, of opportunities. So what does that mean for Ashley and doing stakeholder engagement? I'm out making sure folks um, are educated and aware um, regarding um, offshore wind and its opportunities, um, how it works for everyone and the benefits um, to the, to the uh, community as well as the, um, the state. Um, listen, engage. We know that people are concerned about this. You guys know anytime you do a project or recommend a project, there are concerns from the community as there should be, because that's good, because that means they're paying attention. Um, as a former school board member, I wish more people were paying attention to what's happening in their community. So we're glad sometimes when they come out, and, but that's our job is to make sure they we listen and we engage and we help them be aware of it. Um, again, defining local benefits and investing in the community. So we're ramping up. I should, we're actually getting ready to be more visible in our community. And that is because we're starting our open house season. Um, we hope that we can do in-person ones. Um, they probably will be a bit smaller, but we are doing a self-guided one that'll be on our website that, and I think this is great actually, I think COVID is forcing people to go and do and rely online, but now we should get even more people um, to go and learn more about the project itself on our self-guided uh, virtual tour. And then we'll also have, um, three or four virtual webinar type of, of live events that people can ask questions um, and we can get feedback from them and provide them feedback as well. And we're going to continue doing our onshore and offshore surveys. We just sent a postcard out to those along the transmission route, which goes from Sandbridge into the corporate landing area right now. Um, and that is so they know that we're going to be doing some testing, which most people, it'll just seem like uh, road work that will last a day and they'll not even notice it. Um, but I'm, my name is on that card. So if any of your friends are complaining, you can have them call me if they have concerns. And then we're excited to be working with Matt and Heretta um, and the Department of Energy with the, or DMME um, because we're sponsoring and excited to be part of the, um, the Offshore Wind Conference, the IPF Conference in Richmond in August and hosting and bringing folks here who may be interested in setting up shop in the Hampton Roads region. So um, we do encourage you, these are just some examples of posts on social media, have an office, I'm working from home today, um, but we do have a, um, an office in Gather at Town Center would um, be happy to visit with any of you with questions, but we do try to share um, what's happening with our um, uh, with our project itself, but also um, what's happening in the community, sharing things, you know, studies and that kind of thing that are happening. Uh, the the uh, the study that Matt and his team are working on right now for supply chain, um, sharing all of those kind of things on social media, as ex as well as exciting things like the anniversary, you know, community involvement. So we really don't want to look like you know, we're just a company just flying in to do work. We want to become part of the community and that's part of part of our job. So these are all the ways you can follow us on social media. We would love for you to go and share our posts to help um, broaden the awareness of our project and uh, the commitment of Auburn Grid Renewables to renewable energy and the environment. And then if all else fails, please do give me a call. Um, my phone number is on there and uh, Casey is welcome to send this out as a, a PDF if she hasn't already. Um, and that way you guys will have my phone number and my email and reach out to me anytime. And I'm happy to like Matt to take any questions that you all might have. Did I stop sharing screen? That is one thing from WebEx I can never figure out is how to stop sharing my screen. Oh, here we go, maybe that's it. Stop sharing. There was, I just had to get the drop down to happen. WebEx is still new to me, but something to learn every day. Thank you. You're um, yeah, very welcome. I'm a fast so talker, so if there's anything you needed re repeated, just ask. Do you all have any questions about all these off offshore wind issues? Give people a second. So Matt, you and I were just so thorough. So, and we are excited. I, I will, while you're thinking of possible questions, is the um, the the landing that Matt and Nicole and Doug Smith have come up with over in Norfolk is super, super smart. Um, a lot of the um, expertise is going to be coming from Europe. And so now um, we're happy to be a founding member so that when 
we have folks come to town that we can use not just the, our office space in Virginia Beach and conference rooms, but also we have that opportunity in um, in Norfolk. So we're really grateful and happy to be a, a founding member of that opportunity. It's really super smart and I'm, I'm looking forward to folks taking advantage of it. And we hope that then Matt can convince them they need to establish official residency here in the Hampton Roads area. It'll be good for us all. That's the goal. Hey, Matt. <laughs> Um, exactly. if, Matt, is Casey, I had a question. Um, are you guys at all involved in or interested in onshore wind or is it solely to focus on offshore? So um, good question. So, I mean, I think from a renewable energy standpoint, um, yes, that we are interested in onshore wind and I'll have a two part answer to that question. My job is focused on offshore wind mainly because of the grant funding we've gotten to to stand up our initiative so that's kind of our directive and we think and i mean there's good reason for it in that we think that hampton roads can benefit a great deal economically by being an offshore wind hub um but that said um you know hampton roads um you know i think has the potential to become um somewhat of a renewable energy leader in 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 virginia um because we kind of uh have some issues uh, delivering energy to Hampton Roads uh, via natural gas. So we're kind of um, gonna need to be resourceful just by necessity. And that can mean, um, you know, kind of being a leader in battery storage or onshore wind and solar, like you heard about earlier today. So my job is about offshore, but I think that um, in the greater scheme of things, um, we can be a leader in a variety of renewable energy um, kind of sources. And so, so, so if any of you have driven down 17, the Amazon offshore wind or onshore wind project, if you've gone by to see that, that is an Auburn Grid Renewables project. So that was an part of the development there. So, um, and a lot of those, um, the Port of Virginia did bring a lot of those um, um, foundations, or I shouldn't say foundations, but the turbines and different things in. So this was, this uh, the having a port is huge for just on and offshore um, opportunities as far as that goes. But you do have a the uh, turbine manufacturer in North Carolina. So we, um, I think hopefully you all are aware that the three states, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina did a memorandum of understanding and, and are recognizing this together uh, of all the things they can do. And if you've driven through North Carolina, you know that solar energy is very popular in North Carolina. Ashley, this is Katie Cullifer with HRPDC. I have kind of a silly question. Um, maybe we're... I'm losing her on my screen, but hopefully, can you hear me, Ashley? I just am cursed today. <laughs> I have the magic touch when it comes to IT issues. Well, Matt, maybe you know the answer to this. This yeah, is sure. really put onshore wind. I used to drive past um, that large installation on 17 every day on my way to work. Um, and some days it would be um, look almost like it was frozen or locked down, like they weren't allowing the turbines to spin. And I was just always curious, um, is there a reasoning behind that? Like, was there just too much energy built up and they needed to like pause it? How does that work? So, they know the conditions. Can you hear me? Can you hear me yet? I can, okay. yeah. So the so those each of those is, is actually I know this because of what happened in Texas. I learned all of these things and also because a popular question is for offshore. What about a hurricane? Mm -hmm. And so there is some automation built into um, and programming built into the turbines to know when they should be, you know, when they're capturing it and when they're not, when the conditions aren't favorable. And so there's a way that those blades are automated to shift so that they don't capture the wind. And so that I can answer fun because everybody has the, what about a hurricane, Ashley? You know, nobody wants the blades to, you know, and so won't they spin off, you know, the, no, they won't. Um, and so uh, to make people not worry about that. But yeah, so there's some automation that goes along with that. Thank you. And they even know to shift like where the wind is. So it's, it's amazing. I'm, I'm always in wowed by um, by technology. And what's crazy is with the technology, people always ask how many wind turbines we have. Well, by the time we finally start building it, who knows? Because technology gets better and better. And so when, when you have better technology, you need less turbines. So it's kind of interesting. So what might, um, I think um, Siva was suggesting 188 uh, on theirs. I know that ours could come to that same area, but by the time that we both are complete, 
it could be a different situation. We might need less just because technology. It's like, you know, remember when calculators used to be really big and then they became the size of a credit card? So those kind of things. So. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. And um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the last presentation. But if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat and we'll we'll try to pass them along, get your answers. And uh, yeah, so thanks. Um, all right. So the last um, one we're going to talk about today is uh, um, this EFPF um, grant manual. And uh, let's see, I am going to go over this, I think. Let's see if it does what I want it to do. Here we go. So just a reminder, um, we've been talking about this for a little while. Uh, so there's this Virginia Community Flood Preparedness Fund, new opportunity um, to get some funding related to resiliency. Um, we had uh, fund guidelines out for comment. We made some comments. And now we have the grant manual, which was released for comment in April 12th. But the public comments are due pretty fast. Um, so they're due May, sorry, April 12th. We have a month. Um, so this time, uh, sorry, these are a summary of our comments on the uh, on the guidelines. They were pretty um, high level. Um, we talked about engage, engaging with stakeholders, talking to people a little bit more about um, what they hope to fund, how this would fit in. Um, in terms of uh, what was needed. Um, some concern, you'll see more con concern about what it means to have, uh, be required to have a local resilience plan in order to be eligible for these funds. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could use this funding in, in a lot of creative ways, make sure it, it you know, um, is as most useful as possible. And then uh, lastly, just more adaptive process. Um, this is new, right? It's always hard when you when you have something new to, to get it right the first time out of the gate. Um, I'll go through this. So I just wanted to sort of remind everybody, we're trying to put together these comments that reflect uh, locality concerns, make it so that y'all are excited about applying for these grants and that it fits your purposes. Um, I always try to create comments that are kind of actionable. Like, if we don't like this section, here's how you could do um, improve it to make it better, to make it clear. Um, we will send um, a draft comment letter out tomorrow. And uh, we're also working with the Coastal Resiliency Committee at the PDC. And uh, if if we've missed the mark, please let us know how to make it better. If, you, if any localities are already writing comments and they want um, us to reflect some of their concerns, um, it's helpful to have that information. and. Um, hopefully make a, um, a lot of improvements on this. So here's the grant manual structure. I'm just going to hit the main things that um, have been discussed as you know areas where it could be a little bit better. Um, we had a decent um, conversation as far as participation and numbers. Um, let's see, back in April um, 23rd with the Coastal Resiliency Work Group. So I know a few of you were on that, and uh, we're trying to incorporate those comments. I'll try to make some uh, comments or mentioned some of the local concerns that came up in that meeting. So these are general comments we had about um, this document. There's a couple of definitions. It's always helpful, like I said, with something new to have specific definitions, things like community scale. So that's a carve out, um, or at least the, uh, um, the goal of this program was to um, promote community scale projects. Um, there's also, uh, at one point, they use uh, EJ Justice Community without defining it. That would be helpful to make sure we know what they were uh, intending to reference. Uh, I'm guessing this is oversight. There's two definitions, um, one community resilience plan, one resilience plan. That's kind of odd. I'm sure they'll fix that. Um, one thing that's um, a little bit more specific, um, this, um, the application process requires you to identify two alternatives to your preferred project. Um, I think it would be helpful to remove this. As you'll um, hear, you have to do a resilience plan anyway and kind of have this like um, analysis of what you're doing and why you're doing it so um, the idea of adding this extra um, step uh, will make the application process harder and and as we've heard over and over again sometimes these grant applications they take so much staff time it's a little bit of a disincentive uh, so if we could have eliminate that it'd be great and then the other piece is it would be helpful to have a little bit more of a sense of target from the state on um, how much funding is available um, for the round, and then which, um, how much they would think they want to um, assign to each category of projects or a carve out like this low income um, community um, piece. 
Let's see. All right. So this issue about what it means to have a resilience plan, um, here you have these two different definitions. Um, it's it's just a little bit unusual. Um, you know, this as the starting point, we know that the state wants to promote everybody doing comprehensive planning on resilience. Um, we're just trying to make sure it's clear what's required and maybe this first time around make it a little bit uh, more flexible. Um, your plan has to be recertified every three years. Um, that was one of the questions I think Virginia Beach raised in an earlier discussion is like, what does the certification process look like? Um, I'll be honest, I think it would be helpful if uh, DCR could certify whether or not you have, have a, an acceptable plan, maybe uh, on a different timeline. It, this is going to be a pretty uh, complicated grant application process if you have to go through a ton of studies just to decide if people are eligible uh, for any other funding. Let's see. This didn't move. Let's see. Nope. All right. Oh, I'm gonna see. There we go. All right. So here's the here's the criteria that was in uh, the guidance um, for resilience plans. Quite a few different things. Um, talked about having to incorporate nature-based infrastructure in specific projects. A lot of people do that, but to what extent is a little bit uncertain. Um, all parts of the locality. Uh, you know, I, that is an ambitious goal. Um, I know a lot of people have done more focused studies and I imagine they'd like to get started on uh, trying to get those funded as they move towards um, covering every part of the locality. Um, and then this last piece about based on the be best available science incorporates climate change. Uh, again, I don't think anyone is concerned about that as a broad goal, but what it means is a little bit of a question. Uh, I think CJ mentioned um, the executive orders and whether or not, um, you know, what was required as far as um, aligning all projects under this grant program with all the details of the two um, executive orders that are related to this. So might add a comment about that. So our recommendation in terms of have this resilience plan um, requirement, there's lots of plans that might count, um, hazard mitigation plans, comprehensive plans. It would be nice if um, the state could eventually give a little more of a template, but um, I have heard them talk a little bit in other settings and they seem open to being flexible about this. I think uh, maybe we could just ask more questions in the uh, um, before this launches. I, I think nobody wants to spend a ton of time on something that isn't required, right? It's like trying to just find that perfect mix is um, the ideal um, situation. Another issue that came up was that there's a requirement right now that um, you have to have a locality certified um, flood floodplain manager um, and uh, specifically a CFM and not every city has um, a certified CFM that's in this role. Uh, we kind of looked at some of the data that, um, from the Virginia Floodplain Manager Association. They said that 67 um, of 323 cities and counties have CFM and some of them have uh, more than one and a lot of them have none, right? So we just like some flexibility on different options. I understand that they want to make sure that um, whoever is, somebody is sort of, I don't know, vouching for the um, the legitimacy of the project, but, or, but at the same time, this might not always be the right person. I think, uh, again, a Virginia Beach had an example where they're like, there's different, um, I think Norfolk too, but th this is a trade-off. I mean, like you want awareness uh, if, if these grant applications would be putting in that they're strong projects, but sometimes um, maybe the person that is the CFM might not be um, the obvious, I don't know, staff person to lead these things. So we're trying to work this out and uh, like I said, be a little bit more flexible. Um, one of the recommendations on this is that if this is really important to the state, it would be great if they provided more um, training um, opportunities and make it cheaper and easier to to both get your certification and maintain it. So um, that could be a positive outcome. Here's another part is the scoring criteria. Um, as it stands right now, you get a lot of points um, for um, acquisition, which is a little surprising. Green infrastructure, not at all surprising. Um, stream restoration or stabilization, and then studies of um, statewide regional significance. Uh, so one point 
that we, we, we noticed because we've had this discussion so much on the stormwater side is there really is an equivalent points for shoreline or floodplain restoration as there is for stream restoration. So it'd be nice to even that up. And uh, then there's no criteria for community scale acti activities. So even though that was um, identified as an important thing, you don't get any points for it. So it'd be nice to have um, you know, those uh, kind of be more consistent. Um, so one of the gaps, and I, it's, it's sort of missing, at least in the scoring, is emphasizing risk reduction. So, you know, there's a, a place in this um, application where you would talk about risk reduction, but when we were trying to compare projects, there wouldn't be a clear metric. Uh, you know, a lot of programs like this are based on cost effectiveness. Um, you know, what are you protecting? How much the project costs? Um, sometimes the downfall of that is it, it it kind of ignores um, low income areas where maybe the property values are lower. Although this grant program, it appears, is going to have a fence portion um, of the grants for low income. So maybe, you know, that's the way to go. But some sort of criteria that says, you know, how much good does this project do? And you don't want to lose sight of the big picture goal. And even though we've captured like a lot of other priorities like green infrastructure and, and so forth. Um, again, we want to see that um, shoreline restoration have equivalent project um, points to stream restoration and um, have some criteria for the community scale piece and uh, and sort of, like I said, try to, to capture the benefit of the community. I think the last section uh, I'm going to talk about is eligible projects. Right now, it's capacity building and planning is one category and flood prevention protection projects and studies in the other. We talked about um, maybe breaking this up a bit more um making implementation separately maybe even having three categories and pulling out studies um you know they're just such different things it will be hard to to compare them and and i think it, it's good to have more transparent process because it helps people have buy-in like and what are my chances of getting a grant you know what should i be going for how do i um how do i you know use my time wisely and um you know present um, what I'm trying to do as well as possible. Um, so a little more information and a little more um, structure would be nice, uh, which is what, and then also uh, having a, a clear process for low income areas. Uh, the state has a minimum uh, percent of this grant that they need to use for low income areas, but they could use even more, but just being like clear, like these projects would maybe compete against themselves would be useful. And then um, one of the things that, um, it's a very you know, uh, discreet request, but very important is this idea of being able to use these funds to match federal grants. Um, you know, it's, it's just would really help us um, help localities uh, move forward on, on these um, opportunities. Like if you have a chance to have a FEMA or Army Corps grant, um, then having that state partnership would be fantastic. All right, so I kind of blew through that, but on purpose. Um, like I said, we've had multiple discussions. I know between wetlands and CBPA, this is literally the third round of the same kind of process. Uh, but we want to, you know, make uh, take every opportunity we can to to raise issues of concern. Um, I know it'll probably be easier to just react a little bit to these um, to the draft comments that we had. Um, let me see. I'm just going to take a quick look if there's anything else. I know one of the comments that was raised in our earlier meeting was. Um, recommending that the construction period be five years instead of three years. So we'll probably add that. Um, let's see. And uh, Norfolk had sort of raised the issue of giving some flexibility of how it, there's a score for social vulnerability in, index and um, trying to flush out how to do that. Um, so those, we are listening and I hope that our, our comment letter will reflect everybody's concerns. I'm gonna stop there and yeah, see if anybody has any additions. Um, to this set of comments. There we go. Stop sharing. Have I warned you all out? It's been a long meeting. It's 12 uh, They all look like very good comments. And, and I know that Chesapeake shares a lot of the same concerns. Thanks. And like I said, if any, any if you all have draft comments, even if it's just an outline um, and you are 
comfortable sharing it, let me know. Um, we'll try to align everything we can. All right. Well, I know um, I won't belabor this point. Like I said, keep an eye out for that uh, draft, and uh, and we will make uh, changes based on that. So that is the last presentation. We usually try to open it up to um, you know announcements or comments. Um, let me see. Um, this time, let me start with. Um, do we have anybody from the state? Any state agencies that have any updates or comments? Hi. This is. Uh, Megan Mulroy Goldman from the Virginia Department of Forestry. Um, I just have a quick announcement. Um, our Emerald Ash Borer Cost Share um, Treatment Cost Share program is currently open through June 10th. Um, and this program helps to cover the cost of treating ash trees that would otherwise be infested um, by the invasive insect, the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, it's open to organizations like municipalities, nonprofits, schools, universities. Homeowners associations, and then in this part of the state, it's also open to individual landowners. So anybody who's got you know an ash tree in their front yard or something. Um, and if you have any questions or want information about that, um, you can contact your local forester. So for most of the HRPTC, that would be myself or Kendall Topping. Um, I think Williamsburg and Surrey are on here, and they have different foresters. But if you did reach out to one of us, we would point you in the right direction and give you the information you needed as well. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'll put um, in the chat just a link to um, a little um, fact sheet about the program if anybody wants to take a look at that. Great. Anybody else from the state? All right. Any local government announcements? All right. Uh, NGOs? Consultants? All right. Well, anybody else? I, I think those are the those are big categories, but there's probably some people that don't fit any of those. Whitney, this is Circe Gonzalez. I just entered a link in the chat to the York River and Small Coastal Basin Symposium yeah. coming up next Thursday. And invite anybody to attend and encourage um, your colleagues to attend as well. We have a great lineup and I'm super excited to be presenting it all this year virtually. So thank you. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? All right. Well, thanks for joining. Uh, PDC staff will stick around for a couple minutes if you have any, um, if you want to chat or we, we still miss a little bit of our, you know, hallway time to catch up with everybody. But uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, as we always say, like, please let us know if there's any topics or things you want us to do differently. Appreciate everyone's attending. And I will consider this meeting adjourned. Thanks. Thank you.